Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The show is about to begin. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Concerts That Made Us. I'm your host, Brian. And before we get into this week's episode, the answer to last week's trivia question was, of course, Stevie Nicks. Stevie and Prince were friends. Prince even played keyboards on Stevie's Stand Back, so when she mentioned she'd like to work together again, he sent over a 10-minute instrumental of the music that would become Purple Rain with a request that she write the lyrics. Stevie rejected the opportunity, not because she didn't like the song, but because it was overwhelming. She said in an interview, I called him back and I said, I can't do it. I wish I could. It's just too much for me. So there you go. Stevie Nicks was the one offered to write the lyrics for Purple Rain, but turned Prince down. And now for this week's music trivia question. Which famous guitarist found his mother in bed with David Bowie when he was eight years old? I think this one might be an easy one. I think that's probably a well-known fact. And we've got another five-star review. Fantastic. Five stars. Great host, insightful questions and conversations. Always love finding new artists. And this review was left on iTunes by last week's guest, Alex Miller. So thank you very much, Alex. I really appreciate the review. Now on to this week's episode. Now this week's episode is one of them ones that I really enjoy because it introduces me to music that I absolutely love. My guest is Chris McLernan from such bands as Cold Sweat, Cold Gin and Saigon Kick. Chris is here today to tell me all about his new project, Panic Boom. And why it's taken 25 years for the band to come together and start making music. You're really going to love this episode. So before we get talking to Chris, let's take a listen to their next release, Keep It To Myself. So, without further ado, let's get on with the show.
Chris, you're very welcome to Concerts That Made Us. Thank you for having me. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad. So we're here to talk about Panic Boom. But before we get to that, I'd like to hear a bit about your own history. Do you remember your first musical memory? Yes. Uh, I was dancing up and down on a bed, probably age two or three, I'm told, uh, with my aunts, my godmother, <laughs> um, singing Beatles songs, to be specific, All My Loving. Ah, ah. That's the earliest one I got. You had some pretty great taste then as a, as a kid. <laughs> and it stuck with me, too. So they, <laughs> they, uh, they've, they've remained my favorites. Really? Ah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, uh, you obviously have checked out the, the Get Back documentary then, have you? I have, I have, and it was interesting in um, the aspect from a fan and also as a guy in a band, because mm. it's very much, if you watch it and you're a guy in a band, you recognize a whole lot of that behavior <laughs> from the songwriting yeah. process to just the dynamics. Um, it was fascinating to watch and just realize, yeah, they're just, that's a band. It's like a family. It's like a company. It's, there's just a certain dynamic to the personalities yeah. that are always the same. <laughs> um, but then the songwriting end of it was interesting because you're sitting there watching the songwriting and that's how that goes too. It's just, this an excruciating process. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you're sitting there going, you want to yell, Paul, Paul, it's let it be. Here's how the words go. You know, <laughs> just, come on. I know you got it, but he doesn't know it yet. You know, yeah. he's, he's still figuring it out, but, he, but I know it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was elements in it. For me, where I was watching it and I was like, you know, obviously the Beatles are on such a high pedestal nowadays. It was like, oh, my God, they're actually people. They're just like me. You know, I thought it was great for that aspect of it. Totally agree. I mean, they have good days and they have bad days. Um, there were some things about it that because uh, I saw the original Let It Be um, and it was just such so dreary. Yeah, I mean, the, the you know, it's it's Britain in January, so it's going to be dreary. Yeah. Um, but it's the, it just felt so ugh, just bad. But there was an element in the in the Peter Jackson one where they had, and clearly they had this from the beginning, but they didn't do anything about it when they had mic'd up the, the flower pot in the commissary, and they caught the meeting between John and Paul. That was worth the price of admission for me. Just <laughs> see, that's how they work. That's how they were. That's who they were. That was their dynamic. That was um, a big conflict. And the way they handled it was perfect. I mean, it's kind of sneaky, mm. but boy, was that cool. <laughs> it was, it was, it was priceless for a Beatles fan. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Um, what age were you when you first kind of thought to yourself, I want to start, I want to pick up a, an instrument. I want to be a musician. That was fourth grade. Right, um, right. I was at Our Lady of Grace Catholic School in Greensboro, North Carolina. They were they were offering guitar lessons, and I'm the oldest in a family of five, which is small for an Irish Catholic family. <laughs> but uh, you know, so uh, you, I, I learned early on, you just don't ask for things. <laughs> you know, you've got four others to think about. Just shut up. So uh, I don't know what gave me the 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 courage to say, "Hey, I want to take guitar lessons." And then the success when my parents said, "Okay." And so I got one um, and I started taking lessons and immediately hated it because I was just learning really boring songs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. Now, I'm, I'm, it's uh, what fourth grade. So that's 1971. So you figured I could have been at least learning Alice Cooper or something, you know, yeah. uh, or Beatles for that matter. Even, um, yeah. That would have been cool. Yeah. Um, so I kind of, put it away for a couple of years. And then the, the bridge on it, on the gar guitar broke. And for my 13th birthday, I got a little bit of money and I went down to the local music store and say, hey, can you repair this for me? How much would it be? And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I, it's going to be astronomical. He's like, eh, I think like 15 bucks. And I think I had 20. I was like, woohoo, done. <laughs> Happy days. So I hand it over to him. He fixes it. And on the way out, I grab a Beatles songbook because the weekend before they had been playing Hard Day's Night, like on a constant loop. I guess they had just gotten the rights for it in this Cleveland, Ohio radio station or television station. So they're playing um, Hard Day's Night. And I saw the Beatles playing like because at that point, you know, I'd, I'd never seen them. I'd only heard them. Yeah. So yeah. I'm watching them. I'm getting their personalities and I just enjoyed who they were. And it's like, this looks like, hold it. This looks like fun. Mm. No one told me about this part of it. You know, and the Screaming Girls was fun, too. But I was just like, they're having a great time. Hmm. 
let's try this again. So that's that's what really got it started. And then from there, it was just whew, took off. Yeah, yeah. So you were obviously, did you try to form a band in school or was that something that came later? Oh, no. Uh, as soon as I could. Uh, I had three friends of mine. And it's funny, as soon as you mention music, it's funny to see who kind of comes out of the woodwork. Um, I had a friend of mine, I had no idea, played drums, bass and guitar and at age 14 and 15 was making gospel records with his family. Right. No idea. <laughs> well, guess what? We recruited him. Yeah. Uh, and then another friend of mine, we had we had made the money to make the guitars by um, shoveling driveways during after a winter blizzard in 1978. That been. So or 77. And um, so he and I were like, let's form a band. And so we got this guy and he started he pulled all, all of us you know, up to speed really quickly because we were far behind him. Yeah, um, yeah. And that was my very first band. And then I went to, uh, I went to a boarding school in uh, New Jersey for three years and I formed one there. And that was my first like real band. And we played a gig, you know, that was like, oh, man. okay. We learned material, we put it together, we played the gig. So that was about age 17, I think. Oh, oh not too bad. It must have been a, uh... Was this a disadvantage or an advantage to be forming a band at boarding school? Uh, as a guy, well, that's, I never thought of that. That's a good question. Um, in my case, a bit of a disadvantage um, because what I like to listen to is not what they like to listen to. <laughs> but when we played the gig, they were star for entertainment. So we went over great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, literally, we were playing stuff off of Def, Def Leppard's first record and we were playing Rush and Scorpions and. Um, of course, you had to play Hendrix. We played uh, some, played Scorpions, Coast to Coast. Um, but yeah, we played a whole bunch of stuff that was clearly hard rock. Mm. And what they liked was Pink Floyd, Grateful Dead, Bruce Springsteen, you know, Elvis <laughs> Costello. Kind of not what we had in the, uh, in the, in the set. List. But, but like I said, it went over really well. Ah, good, good, good. You, um, did you have to seek approval from you know, teachers that they have a say in what sort of music you could and couldn't play? No, um, none of that. But we um, we, <laughs> we would get told to turn it down because we were allowed uh, to practice in one of the uh, the math building in the basement. So I, I think, and my father, I think, did this too. They were okay with it because they could hear us so they knew where we were, right? We weren't out causing trouble. True, so that's they, a good way to look at it. They knew where McLernan was. He was practicing and you could hear him and I'd go find him. So at least you had four of us you could do that with. Yeah. So they were, yeah. Pretty, they were pretty cool about it. And then at that gig, one of the teachers got up and sang a song with us. Jeez. So, <laughs> do you remember which song? Yeah. He rewrote the lyrics of Johnny Be Good to fit the students at the school. Yeah. <laughs> now, he sounds yeah. like a teacher I'd like to have had. Yeah. He's an interesting dude. No doubt. <laughs> no doubt. Whitney <laughs> Athoy is his, is his name. A-Z-O-Y. Yeah. Interesting guy. Yeah, yeah. So um you uh you obviously finished boarding school, finished your school days. What was the what steps did you take then? Well, from there I went to college in Madison, Wisconsin, um, and played in bands all the way through college and taught guitar. So I taught guitar instead of having quote a real job <laughs> and uh, saved all the money so I could move out to Los Angeles mm. and make it in the in the last great exodus for stardom in nineteen 19- that would have been June, June of 1985. Ah, ah, so that would have been the days of Motley Crue and guys like that around the scene, would it? So when I got there, yes. When I got there, Poison was still a club band. Guns N' Roses was still a club band. Jane's Addiction was still a club band. Warrant, um, Racer X, if you've heard of them. Paul Gilbert came out of there. Um, trying to think who else. Faster Pussycat, um, LA Guns. All these bands, I, I walked into that. That that was the era. That was the hmm. competition. Yeah. Um, and I remember just thinking to myself, oh boy, you know, <laughs> I'm in for a, a, an interesting challenge. Yeah, yeah. That must have been a wild time as well for I'm sure you got to hang out with them guys when you were playing, you know, in oh, bands yeah. alongside oh, them. Yeah. Must yeah, have been yeah. I bet you have some crazy stories about after the gigs. Yeah, oh my god, yeah, you ain't kidding. Um <laughs> but what what was interesting, like what if all the ones who had good songs were the ones who got it. So I remember seeing Warrant, um, and they had this place. It was this place called the Country Club in Reseda, and they had everyone singing along to Heaven. I mean, well before they got signed. Whole crowd. Um, 
Guns and Roses, we were all thinking, how are they going to live? You know, they're just they're just street urchins. Are they going to not going to live through, through through the first year of having a record deal? Yeah, you know, they had they clearly had something more than, in my opinion, everybody else at that time. They had their vibe, whatever Guns N' Roses was or is, mm. but they had these songs. You walked out of there going, that was a really cool song. I mean, Poison, that same club I mentioned at Reseda, they sold that out seven nights in a row at one point. Oh, man. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is all unsigned. Jeez. So that's that was about, you know, 8,000 seats total. So that's, you know, that's a good size auditorium. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, you think these guys are going to do something? Yeah, I think probably they will. Yeah, more than likely. <laughs> but, um, but when we got there, to walk up and down Sunset Boulevard and just because in Madison, Wisconsin, I was unique. Then those are the days when you, you could tell someone who's in a band. They looked like it. Whereas <laughs> right. now, um, so I get to Los Angeles and I look around. I was like, everybody looks like me and I look like everybody. I'm doomed. <laughs> but uh, it worked. Yeah, yeah. From that point of view, then what did you do to stand out from the crowd? I, I hate to sound boring, but um, I had no bad habits. Never did. Um, when I went on an audition, I learned the tunes. Uh, I looked the part. Uh, my gear worked. Right, My car worked so I could get there. <laughs> um, and I could sing. Ah. But that's what it was that combination because there were guys out there who could smoke me on two or three things. Let's say it was the, the look and playing. Mm -hmm. But they'd show up and they'd show up with their girlfriend in a rotten car and start fighting in the in the ante room. Oh. Like, you're like, right, right. You're just going, okay, I'm just gonna sit back and I'm just gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna worry. <laughs> and then once you get into that auditioning circle, uh, my first audition, my first real one was for Lita Ford. And I didn't get the gig, but what was interesting about it was I got a call, call a couple of weeks later from another band saying, Hey, we talked to David Ezrin, who was the keyboard player for Lita at the time, and he said you auditioned and you weren't right for them, but you might be right for us. So you kind of start bouncing around in this audition circle and getting to know everybody. Um, and that's how you, it's like breaking out of, getting past that ceiling. It's a plateau. Yeah. And it seemingly took forever, but it's funny. You look back and it only took two years. <laughs> <laughs> God, it felt like a long time. I could imagine. Yeah. <laughs> it must have been amazing though. Once you reach that stage and you're like, yes, it's really starting to pay off all my hard work. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Because I had moved out there, like I said, across the country, I didn't know anybody. So I just packed up my, all my, anything I had, put it in, I had a van, put it in the van and went to LA. And I had my American Express travelers checks. I got an apartment in Hollywood and said, all right, here we go. And, you know, you talk about taking all the all your money and just going, all right, I'm putting it, putting it on the table and I'm betting on me. Here we go. <laughs> I hate to ask, though, but what was plan B? Did it ever enter your mind what you'd do if it didn't work? No, I was like, Cortez, <laughs> I burned my ships. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, just, I was like, I'm. Because I come from, a, uh, like I said, I was the oldest, but I, my, everyone in my family is either a doctor or a businessman or s something like that. You know, mm. I, My mother was a nurse. My father was a, a, a big time executive. And I, nobody else in the, in the family was an artist except the generation before. My aunt was an artist. Um, and there's a guy who was in The Wizard of Oz named Ray Bolger who played the Scarecrow. Oh. And he's, he's a family member on my paternal grandmother's side. She was a Bolger. So it skipped one. So <laughs> I'm the one who was the artist. So I knew I wasn't going to go back. What was I going to do? Go back home and like be a doctor? I just, it wasn't me. So I just was like, I'm staying here until I do it. Uh, <laughs> it and I did. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose when with a career like that, it's the only outlook you can really have. You know, I feel like if you set up, a plan B subconsciously you're like okay well if it does I have this but if you don't have a plan B you're more focused on I've got nothing else this has to work you know totally agree yeah yeah totally agree and that's how I approached it it's like everything I did was you know and I mean try, and trying to be smart about it again I wouldn't didn't want to be mercenary because there were guys who did that too just band jumpers mm. so if I joined and I'm in I'm in you know I'm not looking for the next band I would go and dis disband it or just someone acted silly or whatever. And I was out of there, mm -hmm. but it, there was no plan B. Nothing. Yeah. 
No, you're right too. You're right too. And the whole jumping from band to band, like you're right, you would get kind of a name for doing that. You'd want to be the type of person that gives it your all and, you know, like this is my band. It's this or nothing, you know? Yep, totally agree. I had a friend of mine who loves to tease me. He goes, uh, at one point we were out there and he was visiting, he's he's from Chicago and he showed up and he said, all right, so this is the band that's going to make it? (laughs) (laughs) That was my attitude. Everyone, no, it's going to be this one. It's going to be this one. And I was talking to my daughter about it, who's doing singer songwriting stuff. And she said, uh, oh, I'm so discouraged. It's it's so hard. It's, I said, Delaney, I was in 37 bands before I finally got signed. Keep at it. Just keep at it. Trust me on it. Just keep yeah. at it. Yeah. Determination is key. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At what stage did the, um, the Kiss band come? That came up. Um, it's funny. They, the two guys just had their birthdays the other day, Jamie St. James and Mark Ferrari. Um, and... We used to play every January. They would have you know a birthday party. All the musicians would get together. So you had guys in black and blue and cold sweat and um, rhino bucket and all these guys would all get together and and just have a fun party. And there'd always be a communal instrument set up. Yeah. So everyone would get out and play a song. You know, they play a Montrose song or a Beatles song or a Cheap Trick song or whatever. So, but there was four of us that would always get up and we'd only play Kiss songs. <laughs> and. We were dead on. I mean, if you turned your back, you you thought you were listening to them. And it was a huge hit. Everyone loved it. So Tommy Thayer and I were sitting one night in um, this club called the FM Station out in the back of the gallery. Like, you know, why don't we try this just for the heck of it? Let's just go out and play. Kiss T-shirts, you know, jeans. Just play. See what happens. And we drew a crowd. And then we did it again and drew a bigger crowd. And then finally, Jamie, who's just this type of person, I says, you know what? Let's put on the makeup. And I was like, Saint, we don't have the costume. Like, I don't care. Let's do it. He's like, we're either going to be the heroes or going to be goats. And I'm not going to be a goat. And he was right. We were heroes. What People went crazy. <laughs> so that became, well, let's put a version of the uniforms on. And let's get platform shoes. And then let's get the right instruments. And then it got crazy out of control. And we had already done the Cold Sweat record. So this was in between me being in Cold Sweat and Saigon Kick. and. Jamie and Tommy had already left Black and Blue, and I think Tommy was involved with a couple other bands um, that he was a producing. And one, he was Harlow was on uh, Warner's. They did a record for Warner, so everyone was kind of in between, you know, their, their real job and the signed acts. Yeah, yeah. But it just got out of control so fast, in a good way. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was a blast. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's how that's how that started. Yeah, and you you went on to be licensed by Kiss, didn't you, as the official tribute act? They did. Yeah, they were the, were the um, I mean, because there's there's always this, there's this mindset that no matter what you do, if it's involved with Kiss, Gene's going to sue you, <laughs> which is not the case. Um, and he loved Tommy and Jamie. He knew Anthony and I, but he really loved those two. Mm. Um, and I think he did two records with Black and Blue, and um, they toured with them. And I mean, he just he adored them both clearly enough to put Tommy in the band, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, and a good choice, I might admit, I might, uh, might add. But he, um, he, he, and Paul just said, "Look," because they came to see us a couple times, and, and they they offered us pointers. Hey, this part goes like this. Hey, they put this. You're singing that part too early. Hey, if you just try this. So they they helped us with our quality control, which is really generous of them. But they said, you know, Gene loves to say this thing where you have to be careful. The lawyers are going crazy. Right? <laughs> so just do do what we ask you and everything will be fine. So we signed a letter that was basically a cease and desist if they said so letter. Nice. And I think it's because we were using a copyrighted name and trademark faces. I mean, to- now at this point, Michael, totally get it. But, but they did it literally as a formality. It was never held over our heads. They never pulled the, the plug on us ever. They just, they loved it. And they were totally cool about it. Yeah, yeah. One thing I've always uh, wondered about Tribute Acts is, is it fulfilling or is there this need inside you to be doing your own music? You know, are you happy doing someone else's songs all the time? I I was to a point. I mean, because I knew I'd moved out to LA to, to be in a band and make records. Hmm. Uh, and this was more fun than I thought I'd ever have doing this sort of stuff, you know, on the side. And but you're but you're right. I mean, I remember sitting there with Jamie when I put on the makeup, and he just shook his head and he goes, "Why didn't we think of this?" Uh, <laughs> it's like fair enough. Uh, but it was 
it was a lot, it was so much work. It wasn't like, you know, playing in any other given tribute. Like if you're playing a UFO tribute band, probably pretty easy on the costuming and the, you know, that sort of mm. stuff. Um, yeah. No one's going to call you on it if you don't have the right guitar. But with Kiss, everybody knows that. They know what it's supposed to look like. They know what it's supposed to sound like. And we were doing it at a time when maybe two or three other bands were doing it. And like you said, we were the ones that were officially approved by them. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, it, again, Jamie called us the exhibit. He said, we're, we're only going to do this for a certain amount of time. And when the exhibit is over, that's it. Mm. No more. So that's how that's how I looked at it. And we were in a couple of magazines at the time, like Rip and uh, another one. And um, I didn't give them by name because I, I didn't want to get the stigma from other people who were in real bands, as it were, to, <laughs> well, he's in a tribute act. I'm like, well, not really. It was kind of, we didn't, we didn't start it to do that. We started because it was fun. It wasn't, like you said, a burning desire for me to be Gene Simmons. <laughs> no, it just I happen to sing, sound like him when I sing. Yeah, yeah. Don't look anything like him. <laughs> true, true. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> um. So what was uh was Saigon Kick directly after it? Then was there a bit of a, a gap? A few other bands or? No, literally, uh, I got the call. Uh, we were playing a gig in Orange County called Bananas, uh, and I got the call to that their bass player had been fired and um, sent in a package. A friend of mine who worked um, at Mercury. Said, told me that so i remember going to that last gig and telling them hey i've got an audition next week i'm flying out because they knew who Sire was yeah um, yeah and they uh they're like cool cool awesome so yeah it, literally that was the last one and that's and that would have been may or june of 92 yeah yeah that must have been some experience though you know because they were hugely successful and just jumping in and i imagine it just was hit the ground running and that was it it was, and when and I, when I joined, there was you know the single hadn't done anything yet. Oh really? So yeah, they were um, they when I was meeting their manager about the audition, they were editing the video for Loves on the Way, mm. so it wasn't even out yet. So I joined a week later, and it was a single, but there was no way it was close. To this. So this would have been June and July, and so it was you know play, being played on some radio stations, but yeah, not a lot. It wasn't crazy. Um, I got congratulated later for my success in my business acumen for joining a band on the way up. I was like, they're my favorite band. I just wanted to join them. You yeah, know? I really did. They were my favorite band and I got to join. Jeez. Not something that happens to everybody. No, no. And, uh, I've always valued that. And, uh, I think, um, and I, I, that's kind of a parallel with Jason Newstead. I mean, he had joined his favorite band. You know? True, or actually. Tim Owens got to join his, you know, it's a crazy sense of gratitude you're just like okay i'm getting to make records and tour again but literally with the guys i wanted to be in a band with <laughs> this just doesn't happen you know yeah cinderella stuff yeah exactly how long was it before the uh the sense of awe wore off and you actually felt like yeah i'm a member of this band now i think um we played a an mtv appearance acoustically in october of that year of 92. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, I'm on MTV. We're live. You know, we're all going on. And it was their first time on there too. Cause they had done the first record and I'd done cold sweat. So we, we were kind of until the lizard kind of the same. Yeah. Um, um, exposure wise. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, walking out of that studio going, you know what? I feel like I'm one of the four now. So jump forward to 1994 then panic boom. Yes. What what happened there between Saigon Kick and the start of Panic Boom? That was during Panic Boom started. It was called Planet Boom originally, but we Phil found out a couple of weeks ago that there's a band um, in Australia that's a Christian rock band called Planet Boom. Right. Yeah, I did the same eyebrow raise. Really? <laughs> uh, and, uh, he uh, he said, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "Well, let's shoot, shoot around some other names." So I came up with Panic Boom because I. Thought it was like Panic Room or Planet Boom, putting it together. You know, why not? Mm. And they liked it. So off we went. Um, but that was during a, a high a hiatus where Psycho Kick had done a record. We were supposed to do another one. There was some internal struggling, shall we say. Mm. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we went out and um, Phil had started Planet Boom with another bass player. And then um, 
like things do. He just, you know, uh, the guy just wanted to do something else. And Phil said, hey, you want to join in? And I said, sure, what do you got? And he played me the songs. I was like, yes, I would. Um, so then I brought in a bunch of songs I had. Um, and uh, we just started getting getting ready to shop. And uh, we did. And we took it to Atlantic. And they had passed. But then at that point, Saigon so Kick was then all of a sudden freed from the gates and could go mm. financially. So we went back and finished the Saigon so Kick record. So boom, sat there in dry dock with a full record of songs. Oh, man. Um, Re- Revolution being one of them. And uh, I got asked the other night if, you know, Randy had changed the lyrics, you know, just for the time. And nope, those are the same lyrics he wrote in 94. And so it's kind of interesting they still apply. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's crazy so, to think that people are hearing a song that was wrote 25 years ago and they're right? hearing it yeah. for the first time. Yeah. You know, because my fear was we would do it and we'd listen to stuff and go, you know, that didn't age so well. You know, <laughs> should we fix this? And um, that wasn't the case. There's been a couple of things we've, We've updated them sound wise just because of again technology and you play with a guitar rig and you go, well, that's kind of a cool sound. I'll use that instead. But the song structure and all that's damn near the same. So um that's the way or that's what got me back into it. I was like, well, you know, let's take a listen and see what we got. If it sounds dated, let's not do it. Because initially Phil was is doing he is doing it. It's a documentary based on his uh career called 30 Years a Drummer. And Revolution was going to be on the soundtrack. So that was the first shot. Well, let's try it and see if we can even get it done. And we did, and we all liked it. And we thought, oh, you know what? Let's finish them out. So um, so keep it to myself would be the second one in that batch. But we have about 16. And our guitar <laughs> guitar player, Sean, said the other day, he's like, hey, man, I got two more ideas. I'm like, hang on. <laughs> hang on. Um, but what's cool is where we've picked up on the new stuff, it sounds like the old stuff. Ah. So it's not like um, the band sounds like this, this, like if you took ZZ Top and you say, you listen to Trace Ombres and you listen to Recycler, you're like, whoa, it's a mm. different band. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's not that at all. It still kind of sounds, other than, like I said, little technological things, it mm. still kind of sounds like, sounds, I should say, very much like us. Yeah. Yeah. Was there any stage during the 25 years that you came together and were like, let's do it now instead? No. No. Um, you know, because because Phil and I, I was doing TV and film, and Phil was in Skid Row, and you know some other things. So we had, yeah, you know, we all we were in touch. But the idea was like, well, if we did it, what would we do it for? Randy, I think at that point, had complete the singer had completely quit the biz. And um, when I found him uh, on uh, social media, he's he was um, riding bikes and being uh, he was uh, he worked for GoPro, so he would put a GoPro on his helmet and go ride all these crazy crazy off road biking things. And, I've you know, seen surfing. some of his videos. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's. I was like, okay, well, I know him. That makes sense. But he's like, no, nah, I haven't sung in years or whatever. Like, really? All right. So when Phil said, let's try this again, I was like, well, we're not doing it without Bates. Hmm. So if he hasn't sang check in with him and bass came over the first time and sang like okay sounds fine <laughs> <laughs> let's go we're ready yeah so, so but yeah everyone kept in touch but you know went their own ways mm, yeah you know yeah life took over yeah yeah so it was the recording the, doing the song for the documentary that made you guys decide to get back together then yeah yep yeah. It, it was so effortless mm. Yeah, it just fell right, just right there. Just no. I mean, part of that is Phil and I because we played together so much. Mm. But Randy and I, when we first met and we started writing stuff, um, we would just sing. Not, not improv. We had an idea what we wanted to do, but he'd sing and I'd have the melody, or he'd have the melody, and I just kind of sing what I thought over the top of him, and we just kind of blend the voices. Mm. And we didn't even have to think about it; it just flew right along. So that picked right back up too. And that was the big uh, selling point for me because I really liked that. And I really liked writing with him because it was just, I got an idea. Yeah, so do I, so do I, so do I, so do I, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. And it was so cool. And that has not stopped. Picked right back up. That's good to hear. That is very good to hear. So yeah. I have to ask, what's it like trying to get a band off the road nowadays compared to back in the early 90s? Um. Back then, you had the label behind you. Mm. So 
the label was subsidizing. Yeah. Now it would be most likely up to us. I mean, bands now, um, if you're a decent sized band, you can still get so tour support, but mostly you're considered to be self-propelled. You're on your own financially. So, so I've been asked if this, is this band going to tour? I was like, well, that'll be a matter of two things. One COVID, um, two, um, if we can feasibly make it work financially, because if you look at five guys who got to uproot their lives and let's say to do a month out on the road. So there's got to be at least a week's worth of rehearsal figure based. So where's that going to be? Everyone's got to be put up, you know, and, and sheltered and fed and all that. So you got that. Then you head out on the road. So there's got to be a vehicle. So, and if you're smart, you're going to have a vehicle with a trailer and you should have someone who is not in the band drive. Yeah. Yeah. Schedule or she is on a different schedule than the band. So they can rest because otherwise the band is going to have to do the show, get up early in the morning, and then, oh, wow, three hours sleep, drive seven hours. Probably not the best of ideas. No, no, I wouldn't think so. So, um, so those are the main considerations because people say, oh, it'd be great to see a tour or whatever. And I agree. We also, at this point, we'd have one record. Mm. So the smart thing to do would be open for somebody or play festivals. So maybe that, I don't know. We'll, 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 we'll find out. Yeah, yeah. One thing I imagine is hugely beneficial nowadays as well is social media. You know, you can do nearly everything from your home instead of going out and playing clubs and getting a name that way for yourselves, you know? Yep, yep. And we've also talked about getting together, let's say, in Vegas where Phil is, um, who's, you know, an amazingly competent uh, video editor. He's just great at it. Um, we've thought about doing a streaming event. Just we'll go we're, we'll get a rehearsal hall, set up the gear and stream it. You know, that way we don't have to, other than getting to Vegas, we're not having to go to this city, that city, this, you know, just like you said, tune in via your favorite platform. And here we are. Yeah, actually, that would be, that'd be epic. That's definitely something you guys should do. Yeah. We did, um, when I was, well, so I got kick in cold sweat. I did uh, the Monsters of Rock Cruise and um, Larry Moran, who runs that, did a streaming event with Roy Cathy, our singer in Cold Sweat, and a bunch of other guys, um, they put a, just a, together a, a band and just ripped through a bunch of tunes and they streamed it. Sounded great, looked great. I was like, you know what? That's feasible. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, how has the reception been to your song, Revolution? Uh, um, just amazing. Um, the funny thing is people will ask, did you guys just write about whatever's going on now? Or last couple No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 um, so that's really cool. And and uh, the other thing is, people say it sounds current. Just literally sonically, mm. it sounds current. Um, which I think sometimes my generation of musicians get, get kind of stuck in a sound mm. um, that sounds too much like the area you came from. Yeah, um, kind of like silent movies to talkies. <laughs> you know, you got to you got to change it up. Um, and you've got to be modern, even if your story is the same. So um, that's a, that's the reception we're getting the most is that people think it sounds really cool and it's modern. And um, and they want to hear more, which is really good. So they're like, okay, great. Thanks, guys. You know, <laughs> see ya. No, it's they want to hear more, which is really cool. And so funnily enough, we have more. Brilliant, brilliant. I was just going to ask what's the next uh, next plan, next stage for music? Next stage is um, I have uh, since I'm mixing it, I have the rest of the album to mix. Um, so like I said, keep it to myself is done next, and then there's a song called probably Love Child will be after that. Um, and uh, when that's finished up, uh, I have my own project which is called Canel, um, which is um, it's, it's all done, mixed, mastered, ready to go. It just it, it's behind the Panic Boom because Panic Boom just happened to be finished first, but so that's in the can waiting. And if I had to describe it, uh, actually it was described to me as Thin Lizzy meets Ghost. Really? Yeah, well, I'm a huge Thin Lizzy fan. So um, I had given myself the assignment as, of I'm going to write a record. And it says, if I wanted to sell the record to Thin Lizzy and say, you guys, if you want 10 songs you didn't have to write, but to sound like you, here they are. <laughs> um, so I, I did that. And um, so that's next. And then I have... Uh, uh, a couple other things behind that too so there's there's always something cooking he's i you've really piqued my interest now because uh ghost would be one of my favorite bands at the moment and obviously being irish i feel like i have to like tin lizzie you know 
it's oh, yeah, kind of yeah. like uh, your national duty. But yeah. uh, I remember I seen Ghost there just before the pandemic and they actually played uh, Whiskey in the Jar. Or no, the boys are back in town. Did they? Yeah. And they did a brilliant, brilliant version of it. But geez, if there's something that sounds like two of them bands combined, I am there. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll be happy to uh, uh, comply. But yeah, I, and again, I, being Irish American, again, Phil Line, it's, you know, and that band is, I think, ge- genetically in my DNA, I have to acknowledge it. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's, um, we, we had done a Metallica band here, or, or sorry, Thin Lizzy band here called Trouble Boys to, you know, entertain ourselves. Mm. And we played Whiskey in the Jar. Mm. And of course, people are like, it's cool, you guys played the Metallica song. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But but what the cool part is, because we were unapologetic, it was just like, we're going to play the cool songs we like, you know, mm. like um, Opium Trail and uh, Killer on the Loose and uh, Johnny. And um, I mean, so we picked some album tracks as well. And um, it was always fun to see the people who got it lose their mind in the audience, you know, having done with the Kiss thing. I'm not doing it with Lizzie. So I sang and played bass on that. But these two guys came up to us at one gig and they had seen Thin Lizzy and Queen in uh atlanta georgia here in the states in 1977 yeah like that, that was so awesome oh my god you guys did this i thought i'd never hear those songs again live and i was like oh, oh. perfect made my day <laughs> yeah yeah i could imagine jeez <laughs> have you uh, have you heard any of the new ghost i haven't heard it yet i haven't heard i heard um bits of it but i'm i'm planning on my day my next day off now just to immerse myself in it yeah i i've heard three songs and only part of that third song but the two i've heard um call me little sunshine and uh hunter's moon mm. i like both of them uh whole they, they to me i was kind of disappointed by the last record um, right. of theirs it was like uh another instrumental really mm. um can i have a song here guys uh so <laughs> these two i've heard are just I'm like okay cool they're back on it love it yeah yeah Big fan. yeah have you had the chance to see them in concert or see them live I have not. I'm hoping to this year. You know, again, I think they had some dates hooked up um, before the COVID thing really hit. And uh, for me, where I'm in Charleston, South Carolina, so it's not a big spot for concerts. Yeah, and it's a bit in the Bible Belt. Mm-hmm. I see. So, I see. <laughs> no, not, <laughs> not really. They'd probably get a little resistance here, but I have Jacksonville, I have Atlanta, I have Charlotte, so they, they're nearby, so I could go see them. So yeah. I, I definitely want to see them. Because I like the fact that they put thought into the visual presentation. Mm. That matters to me. I yeah. mean, it's it's cool. Uh, that's what I liked about Rammstein. It's like you got this heavy duty music, but there was such a visual about it. You know, they they thought about how they wanted things to look. Yeah, yeah. And that because it's a show, you know, and that's important. You know? Exactly, exactly. That's one of my top things when it comes to concerts. I love going to a show that. The band, they're not just playing music. They're putting on like almost a theatrical performance, you know? Totally agree. Yeah. It has to be yeah. all about the stage show. Even ACDC, I seen them about 12, 13 years ago, and they put on one hell of a show, you know? They had this big train crashing through the stage. And, you know, it's the entertainment factor. Yep, yep, yep. I remember seeing um, Maiden on the Peace of Mind tour, you know, and... um so you had Eddie running around and all. I was like, great, good, something, you know. I mean, they're Iron, they're Iron Maiden, so they're you know, boom, they're in your face, and that's great. But it's still, um, it matters to me to give you something to look at as well, as something to hear, because you you know what it sounds like when you get there. So if you have something that visually surprises you, that adds to it, and I think hooks you in. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, we'll we'll move on to the last couple of questions. So. Sure. I ask everybody these, so I'm afraid you won't get off the podcast till you answer. <laughs> no problem. Bring them on. If you could see any musician or performer for his, from history for one night only, who would it be? Oh, from history. Oh, you bastard. <laughs> um, I was going to say just pop and rock. Easy. Um, oh. That's really hard because recently I've been listening to a lot of Mozart, right. specifically the Requiem. Um, and I love that so to be able to see him conduct that would have been just crazy um but uh i i'm gonna have to subset this definitely the beatles but i would want to see them in the cavern club i think yeah actually that's one 
I haven't heard before. I've seen, I've heard them say, I've heard people say, you know, the rooftop gig or Shea Stadium, but I've never actually heard someone say the Cavern Club. And that's almost like the perfect answer, you know, because yeah. it's before they got too big. So you'd really get to hear what they were. Yep. 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 And they were just, they were just, you could tell, even when you see the movies, that there's, there's some about them. Mm. So be able to watch that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, and then, I would have liked to have seen obviously Thin Lizzy or Queen uh, in their heydays. Um, Van Halen on the first tour, mm. uh, just because they changed everything after that tour. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would have liked to have seen Elvis. You know, I just Elvis on the back of a flatbed truck somewhere in the South in 1954. You know? Yeah, yeah. Love to see that. Um, I would love to have gone to the old, uh, the big band stuff and just watch the craziness is like you know Glenn Miller. Or, any of those guys were playing the gig and everyone's dancing and jumping around. And, you know, that again is an event, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a long list, but I'd say those are the ones that jumped to the, the top of the top of it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned Elvis, actually. I have a, Elvis always has a special place in my heart. When I was like 12 or 13, I got incredibly obsessed with Elvis and every week out of my pocket money, I'd buy an Elvis CD or an Elvis record. And I think in the end, I ended up having nearly every song he ever recorded. So to get the opportunity to see him uh, in concert, oh my God, I think that would be the end. I wouldn't go to any other concerts after that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, uh, he was simply amazing. If you get a chance, uh, if you ever get to the States, definitely go to Graceland. Oh, it's on my bucket list. Yeah. yeah. Cause I've, I've been there and it's, it's really cool to just think, wow, Elvis lived here and died mm. here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he did. But um, yeah, he's, I guess in this day and age, a little bit overlooked mm. um, just cause there's been so much since him and yeah. you couldn't really appreciate like what he really did, but he was just absolutely a force and there was nobody like him. The no. closest thing you get is Sinatra. Yeah, who had yeah. that, that team bopper thing, and I would have liked to seen him too early on. That would have um, been pretty cool as well, actually. Yeah, yeah, because he was the first kind of people go cr- just lose their mind over someone. He, I think mm-hmm. Sinatra was the first, and then Elvis was the second one in the rock and roll biz. So, um, yeah, either of those two, but yeah, Elvis just yeah, he's he, I think he's also overlooked as a vocalist because he was just so cool mm. and he moved so well. Um, and the guy just was just reeking charisma. It just came off of him in waves. Yeah. But if you listen to him sing, he could really sing. He was really musical. Yeah. Especially later in his life, he was almost a uh, virgin on operatic, you know? Yep. Totally agree. Yeah. Yep. It'd be fun to sneak by that 68 comeback special to sit in the crowd for that. Yeah. Or to have a time machine, right? Exactly. Exactly. Jeez. That'd be epic. Um, the next one. So, if you could be locked in a room for twenty four hours with any performer for from history, who would it be? Musical. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I think that would probably be John Lennon. Good choice. Good choice. Because he could play a couple of instruments. Mm. Helpful. Um, funny. Yeah. Right. Smart. Um, to the point, to be sure. And I think that after about that 24 hours, like that'd be enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know You'd probably get your fill. Yeah. Yeah. I've got him. Um, either that or um he'd be good, or um I mean I'd say Ed Van Halen, but I I spent a lot of time with him in the, in the late 80s anyway, so that's kind of a cheat. Um Oh, uh, but or, or Phil Line it be interesting, but I would yeah, I would say I would say John. Yeah, yeah. If you ask me tomorrow, you might get a different one, but John today. Good choice, good choice. Very common choice as well. A lot of people. I feel a lot of musicians would pick him. Yeah. Well, I think after the, the get back thing came out too, people got another glimpse of what his personality was like again. And mm. you know, because he's once I think Yoko walked into the picture he just kind of divorced himself from the Beatles mentally, not completely. Yeah. So you didn't get a view of what his personality was like. Uh, I mean, you do early on with help and hard days night and the, those press conferences they did, but if you see him and, and get back, he's such an interesting combination of clown and intellect. Yeah. Yeah, he is. He is. I feel like 
he almost gets the short stick though. So like Paul gets the the name of the nice beetle and he's kind of, you know, depending on his mood, it could go either way. Yeah. You know? Yep. And and Lennon, I think also McCartney gets the the justified title of musical guru. But if you listen to some of the offhand comments John makes during Get Back, where there's one that really stuck with me where they're talking about a lyric and a song, and he goes, That but that doesn't sing well, does it? I was like, oh, that's a really good point. Yeah. It could be a cool phrase. It could be clever. But if it doesn't sing well, it's no good. Yeah, exactly. It just kind of, it just kind of sneaks that in. And, <laughs> and uh, um, my guess is that he did that more earlier in the career. But by that point, he's kind of like, hey, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm done being a vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And uh, if there was a song that could appear on the soundtrack to your life, what would it be? Huh. Um, I would say Beatles and This Bird Can Sing. Cool. Cool. Very good choice again. Revolver is my favorite Beatles record. So it's, it's the, the I noticed now recently in the last five years, it's kind of now battles Sergeant Pepper as the favorite. For really? most people. Yeah, but it, that's my favorite Beatles record mm. by far. Love it. Just love it. Ah. And uh, finally, this is a new one I'm throwing into the mix. Is there a question I should have asked you? Question you should have asked me. Um, what do I do when I'm not doing music? Okay. Um, nothing. No. Um, <laughs> kidding. Um, I have an interest in. Um, old Chevy trucks. So I have a 1964 Chevy C10 truck that oh, I had man. restored um, and kind of beefed up. Um, Love which it. I'll be happy to send you a picture of. Um, do, do. So it's got a, it's a, got an old, you know, Detroit V8. You know, I mean. Oh, beautiful. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I surf. Right, right. So I love to surf. Um, I, uh, I have a, um, a non-profit where I, you can see them on the background. Those are guitars that are going to be donated. That's what I get them. I find them uh, kind of like in states of disarray. Mm. And, you know, they need some love. So I give them some love, get them functional, put them back together, and then bring, get them to a new home. Oh, brilliant. So there's, there's some a, beauties back there as well. Yeah. Yep. Oh, man. So, but uh, yeah, I love putting guitars together. I, I just, the reason is, you know, when I was, 16 or 17, I saw, you know, this one on the cover of a record. Yeah. Went, what? <laughs> How can you do that? I didn't know you could order parts and put your, put your guitar together. I was like, that, I can really, I can. <laughs> and it's fairly inexpensive and it'll sound great. Oh, what is this magic? Mm. Um, and um, so that got it really, that got me through college too. I, I made my own guitars because, you know, Les Pauls were and still are expensive. Yeah, they are and true. if you dropped them, you're in trouble. Whereas <laughs> yeah. if you got something you dropped and you you know you put Schwinn bike paint on it, hey, you just gotta get another one. You know, spray some paint on top of it and fix it. It's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, so I like putting these things back together, and some of these, some of these really needed some love, but uh, they are now all pretty much all playable. And I get them in, and uh, I was also fascinated and grateful to see how many people were willing to contribute. To, hey, I got this guitar; it's been under my bed, but you know, the, it's missing three tuning pegs. It doesn't have a pickup that works. I got it. I just hand it to me, and I'll find it a new home. I'll fix it up and get it to a new home. So yeah, it's, uh, it's called Changing Strings. So that's the name of it. Brilliant. I have to ask, since uh, you mentioned guitars, then what's your all-time favorite guitar? The guitar itself, hmm. um, a Fender Stratocaster. Really, the old reliable. Yeah, it can do. It can do anything, and yeah. it looks cool. Um, and again, it's modular, so if you break something on it, you just switch it out. <laughs> yeah, and that's just uh, it's like why why I got a Chevy truck is my brother bought a Dodge and he restored that. I got the Chevy because Chevy parts you can find anywhere, even so, now. Yeah, he's, oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, they made millions of those trucks and they didn't change any of the engine or the suspension or the, the axle, <laughs> none of that. Truck. Yeah, why do we need to fancy it up? So with um, 
with my brother's Dodge, you know, those just weren't as popular. They there was obviously they made them, but he couldn't. He spent four months trying to find a gas tank for it. Oh man! <laughs> Whereas with me, like I pop on the net or get a hold of, hey, you got this part of that part? Yeah, sure. When do you want it? <laughs> I have an obsession with American motors, like from especially from the sixties, seventies, and eighties, because we don't get them over here at all. Oh. You've surely seen European cars; they're so boring. But like you guys over there seem to have the nicest, sexiest cars that have ever been made, like the Charger, oh, yeah. the Camaro, the Mustang. Oh, the Dodge Charger, yeah. Um, Greg Chase on the bass player in Badlands had had a a, a Super B. Oh that man! Was, oh, that thing was just so much fun to ride around in. <laughs> I mean, just definition of muscle car, mm. just unreal. Uh, yeah. My brother, who collects more cars than I do, he has uh, he had for a while. I don't know if he still got a '65 Mustang. Oh man! But that was cool, and it didn't have, of course, you know, it didn't have shoulder belts. It had regular yeah. seatbelt. Yeah. And uh, so my nephew gets in and he wants to drive it. He's like, "Where's the seatbelt?" It's like lap belt. He's like, "Huh?" <laughs> like, well, how do I start this? What What is it? I said, "He's like the engine won't start." I said, "You just flooded it." What does that mean? He's like, "Uh huh." So, and my my Chevy, it's a three on the tree, right? So mm. someone will ask to quote, borrow it or, you know, Hey, can I drive your truck? Sure. And they sit in and go, where, Hey, how do you shift? And it's, it's on the here. <laughs> well, yeah. What do you mean? Uh, it's three on the tree. <laughs> what does that mean? You still want to drive it? No, that's okay. Can I just take a ride in it with you? <laughs> yeah. You... Oh, oh man. Well, uh, your song revolution is going to play us out this evening. Do you want to, Tell us a bit about it before you go. Uh, as we as we fire it up, it's um, I want I wanted to hear the contrast in the delivery of the lyrics, so that's why the dynamics are up and down and up and down and up and down, and, and that middle section where it, Randy and I are just kind of almost in your ear. Um, all of that is very intentional. So um, uh, Bates, I think, really he made it clear again that. Um, whatever you're revolting against, you probably got something. Um, and there's probably someone who's, you know, with you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Most likely, especially these days.
What are we doing? All right, give it a shot. Hi, I'm Zach, host of the Belated Binge Podcast, and I'm here to try to convince you to join us as we re-binge some of the most iconic series in recent memory that I also happen to nearly missed out on, like our current reread of the Harry Potter series, which, despite growing up through the hype, I somehow didn't read until I was in my mid-20s. That's the belated part. But now that I have, there's some of my favorite forms of entertainment, so we're going back, a chapter or two at a time, discussing world building, character motivations, plot holes, we theorize, we foreshadow, and we give away meaningless awards. That's the binge part. If you like Harry Potter and need an excuse to reread them, or just a distraction from your day job, you can listen anywhere you get your podcasts. And don't hesitate to join the discussion on the Belated Binge Podcast. Uh... Please. Hey guys, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I for one surely did. Don't forget to check out Everything Panic Boom and check out Belated Binge Podcast. It's a really interesting podcast. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate and review us on iTunes. Your five star review will be read out on the show. And don't forget, you can now rate us on Spotify. You can find and follow us on all social media at Concerts That Made Us Podcast. And don't forget to check out the website at www.concertsthatmadeus.com. And if you'd like to support the show, you can do so by signing up at patreon.com forward slash concerts that made us. So until next time, keep rocking. Hey, hey, what are you guys still doing there? The show is over. It's over. You can go home. Go on. We'll see you next time. We'll be here. Bye.